There once was a guy named Bill. Took his sled on a ride up a hill for a thrill. The hill he couldn't make. It's like someone hit the brake. I thought I had it in the bag. No, his clutch spring had some sag. That made his engine lag. Bill stuck, and his friend Stein gave him a shout. Hey, Fag, quit pissing around up there and bring us a stout. After a huff from his snout, Bill said, Stein, you're going to look pretty funny trying to drink this beer. No fucking tea. How about you? I'm Joe, and today we're going to learn about the end of the ramps. In the last video, we learned about the start of the ramp. Today, we're going to learn about the end of the ramp and what it can do for us as far as using different ramps with different angles to produce different forces. Don't necessarily need to know what angles they are, just need to know that something lower is going to push different, something a little higher is going to push differently, and and which one in relation to the other will be good for you in your application. So years ago this guy calls me up and he's got a summit and it's dedicated racing took it out of the snow and he's dedicated racing to like snow drags sort of ice drags hard snow hard snow start that's pretty much what it gets torn down to right his track lug was an inch and three quarter height it pretty much could only stay with stock engine and then whatever clutching he could do uh, aftermarket exhaust, aftermarket clutching, that sort of thing, but pretty much stock engine. So his problem was he'd come off the line and he'd be like one of the top guys to come off the line the quickest 60 foot and then people would catch up and pass him on the end. I think I have some props. Toys. <laughs> <laughs> so, what he described to me over the phone, and I got him to email me the situations too, so I could uh, have it in writing and, and be able to uh, think about it after. So his sled, compared to all the other sleds out there in the field, which he was in the top six, five, not very difficult to get in the four, but even the top guys who are beating him, where he, say he would get fifth or sixth place in the first four, he'd still beat them out of the hole. So pretty much would go like this, he'd said, he could come almost the hood length out of the hole, and then they'd go down the track, and as they're going down the track, the guy would reel them in and go past them, and then cross them about the same at the finish line, maybe a half sled length, maybe even more, depending on what sled. And there he is, fifth, sixth place. A recap of the run. Comes off the line like that. They're going down, they're going, and then this guy starts reeling him in, and then he goes by, we're on finish line. Hmm, okay. So I went through the clutching details with him, what primary spring, uh, what ramp he's using, uh, is he getting correct engine speed all the way down, or what engine speed does he need to cross the finish line, does he think he needs a uh, secondary spring and a helix angle, and the gearing. Now I knew what mile an hour that his clutching possibly could do, and I couldn't touch the helix, I couldn't touch the secondary spring because of the spring that he was already using. He was maxed out on whatever spring he was using. He didn't want to change the forces. Okay, didn't want to change the primary clutch spring too. So he looked at gearing taller and gearing lower, but when you change one tooth, say you're at 2145 and you go to 2245 that's like four miles an hour difference too tall of a gear to change it that's a big difference you should be geared on a change in say this drag race condition or many drag race conditions uh like 1.8 to two and a half miles an hour so instead of being like 2145 it should be the next gear should be like 2247 or 22 48 and then 2245 so whatever ratio you get in between he, he went and got the gears to get the next two and a half ish mile an hour increase and it's still the same results come off the line like that and then the guide reel him in okay let's look at the ramp now what's going on with the ramp maybe we can get the ramp to push harder and he had a 
Where is it? He was using a 441. And I have the template here somewhere. Well, I'll, well, okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. He was using a straight 441. It's good old fashioned 441. Okay, where is it? CJ's gearing is 2849. He wants to, he thinks a winning mile an hour is going to be 99. He's somewhere in the range of 98, 97 and three quarter mile an hour because of estimate of how much faster those guys are going by him, uh, like by a hood length or maybe bumper to bumper, that sort of thing. And the full shift overdrive is 119 miles an hour. And we'll look on a pulley to see what that looks like. So he wants the belt to be there around 99 miles an hour. And we know the full shift overdrive will be 119. But he wants to cross that uh, finish line at around 99 miles an hour. Whereas, say, right now he's going across at 98 or 97 and a half thereabouts. Okay, how can we see inside of his clutch when he's running when I can't be there? We could get him to look at the ramp, take a mark on the ramp. People do felt marker on the primary clutch. Well, I like to do a felt marker on the ramp. And we can find out where the problem's starting on the racetrack. Remember this ramp? Felt marker. Oh, he didn't like this felt marker trick, I'll tell you. So people go take the felt marker and they mark up the primary clutch and then they go do their run and they see where the felt marker got wiped off, right? So what I wanted him to do is he's got a marker up his ramp, right? Like so. And then put the clutch back together. And what he's got to do now. <laughs> okay. He comes off the start line like that. And then they're going down, right? And then there's a point down the track where the guy starts reeling him in. Right there at that point where the guy's reeling him in. Even, even, even. And then he reels him in. So what CJ has to do is. Boom, he comes off the start line and he's going now. He's got to look back. He's He's got to look back behind him to see when that guy is reeling him in. They come off the line, we're up, like that. And they're going down the track. So we're thinking it's slow motion here. CJ's got to look back now. And when this guy starts reeling him in, let off. And, like that. What happened? <laughs> so, <laughs> CJ's like, what do you mean let off? So, well, you let off. So I'm telling <laughs> what you're going to do is when you speed down the course like that, you got to look back and see when that guy's reeling you in. The moment that he starts to reel you in is the moment his sled's starting to push harder than yours, right? So he figures it's about halfway down the track estimated the guy is starting to reel him in and then and go buy him at a substantial <laughs> mile an hour increase across the finish line yet albeit it's not that much he's getting beat by but it happened way back here at somewhere between the 300 and the 400 foot mark that's where you gotta let off the gas you have to make a sacrificial run boy you got a hole shot him so now you're gonna get out there and then He's gonna start reeling you in. You gotta be looking back there to see when he's reeling you in. So when he starts reeling you in, you let off the gas. What? I'm not letting off. You're gonna lose against him. Yes, you are. You're gonna lose against him anyway, ain't you? Maybe. Listen, boy. When you let off the felt marker line on the ramp, it's gonna tell me where on the ramp it needs to push harder. Where on the ramp that felt marker line is, is telling me where his sled's starting to pick up on yours. Does that make sense there? Yeah, that makes sense. The way we're measuring this, it doesn't matter if you have a long track or a backcountry, a short track, a race sled, a hill climb, it doesn't matter. It, it's just measuring. What I'm showing you here is, here's an example I did like 13 years ago, 2007. 
in 2007, I started developing this ramp here. This is a cross between a 415 and a 441. In 2008, with the problems that some of the summits had, as far as over revving up at high elevation because they used a 413 ramp, I started working on making this ramp here based on the engine speed problem and track speed problems guys were having, say in Revelstoke where I was going. Here we have the 441 ramp that Buddy's using in his Summit drag race sled. Here is zero feet and here is 660. What I want him to do is leave the start line. Boom, it's gone, right? Here's the roller going down the ramp now. As his speed increases, the roller's going down. He's looking back and he's seeing Buddy start reeling him in. Boom, he lets off. So now the roller went from here down to here, say, the roller ended up wiping off to about here. He made his run from here to 350 feet, let's say, let's off. Sacrifice the run, and now he has the information where most of the guys are starting to reel him in, in this lane, or whatever lane he's in. This portion he was good with, and right about here is where the, where the opposing sled started to reel him in. Bang, lets off the fuel. Turns around, and now we have the line to show what we have to do here on this part of the ramp to make it push harder. Piece of cake. Pause on this paragraph in the blue and read it. But the last sentence here, but the shift speed of the pulley will have changed. That's what I want to do because Buddy is catching him and passing him. So then CJ sled, his shift speed needs to change. Nothing fancy here, right? You got a ramp, it's got a curve, start of the shift, end of the shift, ramp, <laughs> it's curve, start of the shift, end of the shift. So it kind of works like that, or say, you could say like this. Oh, I've had these since 1998. Good old tuning weights. Right, doesn't matter. And look at these Dalton weights. I've had these since, I'm uh, gonna say around winter 2008. Could adjust the screw in the, down the center. Same thing, right? Old Yamaha weight from the 80s, I don't know. Old Polaris weight from the 80s, uh, let's see, 98 XCR 440. <laughs> wow, look at that. Page 33 in this old A and handbook. A will make it more aggressive and lower the RPM in the high ratio. Here he grinds off material to make the ramp work faster and push harder. Okay, same thing, right? Zero miles an hour and CJ's full shift overdrive is 119.99. And we know by his ramp, CJ sent me a picture of the ramp, the felt marker all the way down, felt marker was worn off to about here. Okay, let's do what Ian says. Would that be fair to say what you've seen on the TRA ramp that would be around here? CJ's mark is here. So we're gonna go cut, we're gonna leave this alone here. Don't touch this and then modify this side. Okay, would it be fair to say like this too then? You could A, will make it more aggressive and lower the RPM in the high ratio. We're gonna modify this. Okay, let's take this out. Do, 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 do. Gone. Would it be fair to say that this is a representation of this? If A says to grind off this material, then would it be fair to say that's what we're gonna do on this? And that's what we're gonna do on this. Since we know the start of the shift is here, the end of the shift is here, he was having a problem right around here, start of the shift is here, end of the shift is here, full speed, right? Crossing the finish line. He's having a problem right about here. We're not going to touch this. This is where we're going to change. There's no ramp available out here that I know of, not even in some of the aftermarket that pushes harder than this on top end. Maybe there is. I haven't seen it yet. If it's a production ramp, I'm going to make this then. I'm going to do what Ian said and grind this off. Any old timey tuner recognize this? This is a ramp grinding block from Fast. I don't know how many years I've had this. I'm going to say early 90s, maybe 
1990, I don't know. It, it It's probably like 30 years old. Back then, how what kind of what this was used mainly for it's, was to cut a notch in a ramp for high engagement, say. You would put the ramp in. This is a Yamaha ramp. It's made for Skidoo uh, and Polaris. You would stack three ramps and then put the appropriate spacers on. And it'll go something like this. This here is a ramp grinding template. <laughs> Look at that. This hole here would give you on a 147 ramp 4200 engagement. This hole here on a 147 ramp would give you 4800 engagement. So there is a different angle on the geometry here in relation here to here. We would just turn it around, right, and get and grind for the different engagement. And how you used to do it. I'm not setting it up properly. I'm just showing for fun illustration. Then with the sanding drum, you would plunge down in here and it would get the notch for the engine speed that you want. My thanks to buddy Dr. Do, <laughs> Bob, Bob from New York, who got me these. They're replicas. They're not the original ones. Ramp for 5,000. PX ramp for 5,000 RPM. 144 ramp, 144, 4100, 4700. There isn't anybody who makes these anymore. I haven't seen them. I think Dalton and Goodwin were the last men standing to actually make one of these. If there is some out there, I don't know. I'd like to hear in the comment section if there is somebody who makes these ramp grinding blocks still. Here's a more modern one. I know I'm kind of focused on Skidoo, but I'm using Yamaha ramps because to me it doesn't matter what ramp you have, it boils down to the principle of how the parts work. I'm just simulating a drum here, like a spindle sander drum, and then say I would go in and do this. Where I got to cut my teeth the most with these things was back in from like 96 to 2000 with uh, Articat Snowcross Racer, Dave Stenlin. He won the Ironman competition that launched him into the race department at Articat. And Dave asked me to come over there. And I spent four years at that factory. And oh, what a joy. I learned so much about clutch tuning up. <laughs> and dealing with these weights. Before I ever really done much with the TRA. Okay, so same thing. Spindle, drum, sander. And then you would just work away at it. Grinding off what you need. Back in the day, there was this really minty guy named TT670 on Dutalk forums in like the early 2000s to the mid 2000s. Disappeared, don't know whatever happened to him. And he seen me working on ramps because I was posting pictures on Dutalk and he kind of gave me shit about doing them over here on the drill press. He said, he said, that's no way to do them. I mean, it's a good way to do them if you want to do them one at a time, but he goes this here bends too much when you're doing three at a time and it takes way too long and he showed me some pictures of his oscillating spindle sander and i'm like what what the heck's an oscillating spindle sander this is an oscillating spindle sander oh look at that <laughs> i went out and bought one right away went and looked around he said oh this is probably one of the best ones so I priced one out, brought it in. I've had this, I'm going to say, around 2005. This thing here, I'm in Thunder Bay, Ontario, and this has gone out to Revelstoke. I've grind ramps in Revelstoke. It's gone up north to Grand Prairie, to uh, Tumbler Ridge. I've worked with this out there, and it's gone to New York State down to where Snowdio is twice. I've had this done. So this thing's been around. <laughs> I've This thing has... Well, gave me a lot of knowledge, I'll tell you right now. And it's mostly from taking a chance and making some mistakes. Okay, so we have CJ's ramp. Not touching this portion. We're going to grind this portion. And this is what I used to grind out the angle on the ramp. First, I start out with the chorus drum to get into the groove of it and take most of the meat off and get about probably a quarter of a millimeter away from the line that I'm going to draw on the ramp. Then I go through with this intermediate core. I don't know what it is. It doesn't say any inside. I think it might be 150. Doesn't matter. And never throw away your used out drums ever because the surface on this now, being it's worn off, polishes this to like a mirror finish. Does such a 
minty job. Here's some I use for making a notch or I'll make a start angle for whatever buddy's application is and and then I'll use this wore out one to polish off the surface at the start. So the smaller ones are mostly used to make angles at the start of the ramp. I'll just use a simple paint pen to mark up the side of the ramp I'm going to take. How do you know how much to take off on this ramp? Here is CJ's line. So all I'm going to do is give her a little twist there. That's about it. I'm not going to touch any of this here. I want this to push harder. So that's where I'm going to start my line. And I'll scribe. Now I got my line. I'm going to cut in here. I'm just illustrating with this drum. I'm not going to put on a drum. I'm not going to cut a ramp for you. But I'll show you just what it looks like we're going to do. There you go. And you'll take off the material on this side of the line that you cut. Here's the 441 ramp where the problem is, right? That line. All the starts of these are the same. Here's the template I made now for him. Look here, how much deeper it is. Only worked from where the guy was reeling him in to the finish line. I'm not going to change here. None of this is a problem. This was good. Squirts out in front of the guy. And then he starts having a problem. The guy reels him in here. And he reels him in on top end. <laughs> but that was with this ramp. <laughs> not with this ramp anymore. There you go. Does that fall in line with A? will make it more aggressive and lower the RPM and high ratio. And, but the shift speed of the pulley will have changed. But guess what? He still had correct RPM with that ramp. If he has correct RPM with that ramp, but now the guy couldn't catch him, then we're going to cut a little bit more until he loses RPM and then go back to the previous ramp setting. So I ground a few more sets of ramps for these. He ended up finding out what was too much, and he lost engine speed. But we ran out of primary spring finish for us, so he went back to the previous ramp. And now CJ Sled, I can't say his name. I'm not even going to tell you where he's from or nothing. And he's got one of the top snow drag summits out there with this because we tapped into... Ian's knowledge. The amount of centrifugal force converted into shift force depends on the angle between the flux. Ah, oh, who cares? Yeah, we'll just do this. <laughs> I hope you figure out now that <laughs> more angle can make higher engine speed and lower angle can make lower engine speed and higher angle can make higher shift speed and lower angle can make lower shift speed RPM. Here we have a 413, 438, 441, and my CJ cut, first one, first cut of his. And then you could see, say through right about this much, so if this is zero mile an hour and say this is about half track speed, that all the ramps are, you know, pretty close to the same. But then let's start looking at the end of the ramp and see how much they push. This one pushes the least hardest. This one pushes harder than this one. This one pushes harder than these two. And this fourth one here pushes harder than all these three. So let's, I don't know if we can, there we go. Look at them like this too. Oh, well, fancy that, eh? <laughs> Look how much they're laid down. This pushes X. This pushes a little bit more than this. This one pushes harder, and this one pushes the hardest yet. Here are two 600 ramps. You'll see this common in a high elevation, 600, 4,000 feet and higher, ETEC. This will be for the low elevation, 0 to 4,000 feet. The starts are almost the same within a Nats whisker. They go down to about half of the shift, whatever your gearing is. And then towards top end, you can see the 440 pushes much harder. Now, why would they use this in a high elevation setting versus this? This one here will use a 17 gram weight 
from zero to 4,000 feet. This say will use somewhere around 12, 13 grams from 4,000 to the highest elevation. If you were to use this one here at high elevation with 12 grams, zero mile an hour, once you start getting out there towards top end, if you had 12 grams on this ramp, this thing's gonna over rev. Like it'll go right to 8,300 because it's not pushing hard enough. Now at high elevation, when they use 12 grams, you have correct engine speed as your shift increases. So say 30, 40 miles an hour, once you get to 50 miles an hour, the sled's geared for 70. With that 12 gram being so light, the ramp is pushed down more. It will not over rev. It will maintain its 8,8100 right to top end. Some pretty smart techs at BRP figured that one out. So for those who haven't seen one apart, here I'll show you what's going on. That's the clicker bolt that sits in the clutch and it comes out and it spins around and then you put it in the next position tighten the nut down and go and it changes the ramp position due to the cam angle and we'll show you how much it drops safe on this one from clicker five to clicker four zero is on the number three there clicker five we'll take it out not quite a tenth of an inch not very much to get a heck of a lot more shift force that's 200 rpm in the conventional clutching we have one clicker position changes about 200 RPM. Or, <laughs> if you had a half clicker, <laughs> 100 RPM. <laughs> yes, I was making my own clickers, my own half clickers. But the P drive sank that idea. Oh, gee. <laughs> get to the p drive i don't know i'm gonna have to think about this bucket let's drink